the only shooting stick with one-handed trigger pull adjustments, has a new way to keep you at the top of your game. The Trigger Stick Apex, built for sturdy support that adapts to unforgiving terrain with easy adjustments to make your big shots. With our Durasteady three-piece carbon leg design and interchangeable rock-solid clamp, nothing tops the Apex. The Trigger Stick Apex, only from Primo's. Midway USA brand product designers have one straightforward goal. Develop high-quality, technically sound products and deliver them to customers at reasonable prices. If you are immersed in the shooting sports industry and pay close attention to every single detail, you know our products are built right and stand up to everyday use. Who has shooting mats and range bag systems to hunting clothing and just about everything for the outdoors? Log on and shop 24-7 with super fast shipping. MidwayUSA.com Welcome to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. I'm Matthew of castingacross.com, where I explore the quarry and culture of fly fishing. This is the 238th episode of the podcast, and today we're talking about what is arguably my favorite kind of fly fishing. And so we'll talk about that here in a minute. But before I get to that, uh, because it's the 238th episode of the podcast, that means we are two episodes away from the 240th episode of the podcast, which is going to be my next episode that focuses on listener and reader feedback. So if you've heard something in the podcast that you want me to follow up on, or if you want clarification on, or you have some different perspective that you'd want me to interact with, or if you've read something on the website that you have that same kind of question or comment or even an accusation, then please reach out, Matthew at castingacross.com. I always try to have three or four emails and messages that I you know, want to interact with, but uh, if what you uh, bring up has uh, six or seven minutes worth of content, then not only will I interact with you personally, but it'll also make it to the podcast. So send those to Matthew at castingacross.com. So what I'm talking about today is something I've talked about ad nauseum for the last five, six, seven years as I've been doing pet casting across. And that is because it is probably my favorite type of fly fishing. Now, I love fishing spring creeks. And if I had it my way and, and I lived in an area where this was a easy thing to do, then I would say that spring creeks would probably be my favorite type of fishing. And and there for years, it certainly was. When I was living in Pennsylvania, I spent more time on spring creeks than anything else. And it was a challenge and it was hard fishing a lot of times, but I absolutely loved it. Uh, now that I live up in New England, I'm very close to the coast, and I just absolutely love fishing in the surf for stripers. It's a completely different way of fishing um, than I grew up fishing. Uh, it is a big and powerful and strong uh, and aggressive type of fishing, and I really like it, but it's also very peaceful because there's a lot of repetition to it, and uh, you're, you're not moving as much uh, with your feet as you are with your, your arm and your shoulder. Uh, I also love fishing warm water. I mean, right now, uh, there's there's not a lot that is more peaceful and calm than getting out in the canoe with one of my kids and throwing a popper for bass or for pickerel or for big panfish. I mean, that's great too. But if I were to have to take the entirety of my fly fishing, uh, and I've been doing it now for you know almost 25 years, I would probably have to put mountain creek fishing as my favorite and as my most consistent and as what I believe to be one of the most rewarding types of fly fishing. Now, if you've been fishing for a long time, there's a chance that you see fishing for mountain trout, like brook trout or cutthroats out west, as being a simple way of fishing. And it really is in a lot of senses, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. And so if you are a beginner or you're a novice and you haven't spent a lot of time fishing on these high gradient streams, which we'll define here in a second, then this would be a great uh, introduction to a very attractive and exciting type of fishing. But if you have been fishing for a long time, this might be for you also, because I know folks who fish big rivers or even who fish moderate sized uh, freestone rivers, just kind of your traditional fly fishing imagery, you know, walking into a stream that you can see upstream for a long way, you can see downstream for a long way, and you can make a long cast and have a nice long uh, drift and presentation of your fly. And although there's 
complexity that comes with that. There's also the simplicity and the room for error in that you are probably in one cast on a normal freestone stream presenting your fly to a number of holding spots to a number of fish. So you might be able to stay in the same spot and fish for hours and fish to multiple fish and not put them down and even catch multiple fish out of the same spot. You're not going to have that same sort of luxury on a mountain creek. Um, if you fish warm water, uh, the idea of fishing in something tiny and closed off might be intimidating. So all that to say is that I know folks who have fished, uh, who are, are very accomplished anglers in larger rivers, in medium sized rivers, warm water ponds, even on the ocean, who look at fishing for m trout up in the mountains and say, I really don't get it. I know it's cool. I know people like doing it. I know that there's hiking aspect involved. I know that the fish are beautiful and small and wild and usually eager to take flies but I'm really not sure exactly how it works. Um, and so this podcast would be for you also. So this hopefully uh, covers the gamut of, of brand new anglers all the way up to expert anglers who just aren't super comfortable with going up into the mountains. So what do I mean by mountain streams or mountain creeks? Uh, this is a high gradient stream that flows from up in the high elevations down into the valleys. So you'll get these anywhere and everywhere. I've fished in mountain creeks as far north as Maine and as far south as South Carolina. I've fished them in the Rocky Mountains, and I've even fished them in what you could call kind of high gradient streams in the Midwest and a couple of kind of cool places. But by and large, this is when you see people catching bright little brook trout, bright little cutthroat trout, this is where they're doing it. And by little, I mean little compared to what you'll find in the bigger river systems. So a lot of these streams, those 12-inch fish are trophies. Now, can you find bigger ones? Absolutely. Do brown trout find their way into these systems and really take advantage of the uh, you know ecosystem that uh, is there and the forage sources that are available to them? Of course. You'll be surprised by some of the fish that you catch. But by and large, under normal circumstances, you're not going for large fish. You're going for a particular type of fish that lives in an ecosystem, usually wild fish, hopefully native fish. And that is one of the more exciting ways to do it. You also are going to have all of the aesthetic benefits that come with going up into the mountains. So it requires hiking and usually hiking with a little bit of elevation change. Now, this isn't always the case, but again, we're speaking in generalities. Solitude is something that comes with it as well. Uh, there's a lot of times where I'll have three or four streams that are on my mind and I will drive from parking lot to parking lot to find that lot that has no people in it. So I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but what do I do? How do I approach fishing a high mountain stream? So the first thing I do is I identify a stream that holds fish. And honestly, this is any stream and every stream. When you get to a lot of these ecosystems, when you get a lot to these you know, ranges that uh, brook trout or cutthroat trout are, are native to these areas, as long as there's not some sort of grand ecological disaster that's happened recently, there's a very good chance that these streams will hold fish. There are states that I fish in, um, think of Virginia, think of New Hampshire, where particular streams don't have any sort of special designation on them as being brook trout fisheries, yet they contain viable fishable, exciting populations of brook trout. So these are the streams that I identify. And one of the things I've talked about before that I think is really helpful is you find a stream that is a popular stream and you look for other creeks that are adjacent to it, you know, a couple miles north, south, east, west of them that kind of have the similar feel and a similar uh, look and a similar water quality. And you can probably find fish in those places and maybe even better fishing than the fishing that you would find in the popular stream. I know this is the case for a number of places that I fish up and down the East Coast. So that's the first thing I do. And then I do what I said before. I have a couple of streams in mind. And when I wake up in the morning or when I you know, am able to bug out of work early, then I go and I try to find a stream that has a parking lot where there's no cars in it. Uh, because like I mentioned earlier, we're in a freestone stream, you may very well be able to walk into the water, make a 30 foot cast across from you, and you're going to be fishing to fish that uh, could be in a, a number of different holding spots over the course of a drift of a cast, where even if somebody was fishing there earlier, they might not have disturbed those fish. A lot of these mountain streams are smaller. And so consequently, if somebody's fished ahead of you in the last few hours, those fish might still be put down. So could you fish up some trout that uh, have seen flies earlier that day? Of course. 
I like to fish to fresh fish that haven't seen anybody that day, bare minimum. So I try to find that spot and then I walk. So fish don't only get put down by uh, people fishing that day, but fish get fish put down easier uh, by consistent pressure. So I pass up beautiful water. I do my best to pass up awesome pools just to go a little bit further upstream or sometimes a little bit further downstream. Uh, and I do this just as a matter of habit and a, a practice of getting past where most people fish. Because again, one of my desires, and a lot of people, what they like to do when they're fishing these mountain creeks is to get into fish that haven't seen as many flies. Uh, not only does this mean uh, the potential for a fish that may be e more eager to rise to a, to a fly or chase or pursue a fly, but it also might mean fish that um, larger fish that aren't aren't as wary. And you know, if you get to be a bigger fish, it's because you have life experience. And if you are fishing in most places, again, in the East Coast and places that are easier to access out in the out West, uh, those those bigger fish will have had more chances to see flies, uh, especially if there's access to these creeks. So what do I do? How do I approach? What's tied on? Well, one of the things that I like to do is start with a dry fly. I like starting with a dry fly because especially as you get into the spring and summer and then well into the fall, a lot of these fish are have to be opportunistic feeders. You'd be really surprised at the uh, just the, the abundance of macroinvertebrates that you would find in these small mountain streams. You turn over a rock, you grab a, a handful of leaf debris, and there will be a lot of bugs in it. But usually it's not the same kind of, of load, uh, biological load, that is carried in a freestone stream or certainly in a tailwater. Um, so even though you'll get a handful of insects, it's not as rich as a lot of these freestone streams. And there's a number of reasons for that. But a lot of times it's because these, these creeks do get scoured out, especially in high runoff late winter and springtime situations. So they're not going to hold as much um, material, which is what starts that life cycle of those smallest um, critters that, of course, move up to bugs and then small fish. So they're going to be in there. They're just not going to be in there with as much prevalence as in a larger water body. So consequently, these fish are going to be more opportunistic. Also, there's going to be competition among all those little fish. Once a brook trout or cutthroat trout spawns, then there's going to be competition between those small fish for that reduced food source. And so opportunistic feeding is something that is going to be part of their kind of mindset. That means that they are going to rise to dry flies. Whereas in a freestone stream where they are really only going to queue in on dry flies more often than not, when there is a hatch going on, on these mountain creeks, you're going to be able to cast that humpy, which is, in my humble opinion, the finest uh, attractor dry fly in the world. Um, or even that parachute atoms, if you want to kind of hedge your bets. And that fish is going to look up and it's going to pursue that fly uh, because it has to be opportunistic. And so that's usually my, my first impulse. I will have a kind of a smallish dry fly that is tied on that I will make my very first casts with. And where are those first casts going to be? I love queuing in on first and foremost at, at plunge pools. So a plunge pool is that just picturesque situation where you have that gradient water coming down and it is coming over a rock or is coming in a, a crease between two rocks into uh, that next pool below. And what that creates is it, it all sorts of neat hydrological things where that water is tumbling over. It, it has, over the centuries, carved out a little bit of a pocket, not only right below it and downstream of it, but also behind it, which gives that fish a number of places to sit and feel very safe. And so casting that dry fly right into that froth and that foam uh, gives you a few different presentation options. If that fish is sitting anywhere near where that plunge is or or anywhere downstream of it, it is going to be able to see that fly drop in and go and chase it and be ready. You know, if you approach a creek like this, be ready for your very first cast to yield a rise. Now, it could be a dace. It could be an incredibly small trout that can't even fit your fly in its mouth. But catching fish and having fish hit your fly is going to become a very, very commonplace thing in fishing in this situation. So that's my my way of approaching it. Now, this doesn't mean that there's not fish in the runs, kind of the, the stretched out area behind that pool or the riffles, the area immediately um, 
uh, upstream of those plunges or in different longer stretches of that water where it just goes over rocks. Those are perfectly viable places to fish and there's fish all over the place. I think that's the other thing that I think is one of the big misconceptions is that you only fish plunge pools. Now you can only fish plunge pools and if you fish where I fish, I would encourage you to do so because that opens up all of that other water to me. But one of the easiest ways to get acquainted with these streams and to kind of figure out what fish are keying in on is fish these plunge pools, which gives you an opportunity to kind of get in a good position. And also, more often than not, you can position your, your cast such that you can fish an entire stretch of a pool and you give multiple fish, if there are two or three fish sitting in one of these pools, uh, an opportunity to see your fly. It also obscures you from that fish. Now you get the benefit of that plunge, so you have the water is being disturbed a little bit, and if there's enough gradient, then you can almost be below the fish, not just downstream from the fish, but below the fish. Now that's something else that I neglected to mention. I love fishing these things um, from the creek. Uh, I like fishing in the water. I like wet wading. If I have to wear waders because it's particularly cold out, then I'll do so. Uh, but I like fishing in the water facing upstream. Uh, there are certainly situations where you can make that cross stream cast or cast from the bank, but I like being able to get low and being able to cast from downstream upstream. That gives a few advantages. First, it keeps you out, keeps you out of that fish's view because that fish has a conical upward and forward uh, um, uh, field of vision. Uh, as I've always said, you know, check out what a fish's field of vision is. You can just Google that and you'll see some diagrams and illustrations of what that looks like. But by being downstream, that puts you in a really good uh, position to be outside of that fish's field of view. Because not only are these fish opportunistic feeders, they are also very wary of predators, whether it be uh, birds, whether it be uh, um, mammals or uh, larger fish or, or anglers. So being downstream gives you that opportunity, but also being downstream usually gives the opportunity of making room for your back cast. Uh, and that is the most important thing uh, when you are casting in these situations and in these, um, these environments. Because your your forward cast, your presentation cast, of course, matters. Um, but uh, and, and you have a, a channel and you have a uh, a a pathway for that forward cast because obviously there's a pool in front of you but behind you is really what you want to pay attention to so if you're in the middle of that stream and that stream isn't making hard dog legs left or right then you have open water behind you so that allows you to make more casts and longer casts which can be beneficial uh, if the water is clear or if it, it does experience some pressure so that is kind of the where i position myself and where i make my first cast and the first fly that i go to now if that doesn't work or the pool is particularly deep, then I will put on a small weighted streamer. And by small, I mean size 10 and size 12. Now, this doesn't mean that a larger streamer, more traditionally sized woolly bugger or something like that won't work. But I like to have a very small streamer because that gives me an opportunity to pursue more fish. Um, it's not just the largest fish, that 10 inch or 12 inch fish in the pool, but I can still get after those six and eight inch fish. And so a size 10 or size 12, uh, like something like a woolly bugger with a bead head um, and uh, some some passive uh, fishing action in it. So that marabou and that hackle is going to be a wonderful pattern. And casting that up into the plunge pool and allowing it to get shot downstream or shot down into that pool and then quickly retrieving enough line so that you maintain contact with it is probably the most efficient way to fish. So hear me on this. Even fishing the dry fly, although it's going to catch many fish, it's going to incite many rises, that streamer, that tiny streamer that is going to imitate all sorts of things, a bait fish, a nymph, a who knows what that that fish just wants to check out is going to be the most productive thing that you can fish in a stream like this. More than nymphs, more than dries, more than terrestrials. I personally believe, and in my experience, a small streamer or a nymph with a whole lot of tail and a whole lot of uh, bugginess is going to be uh, the most effective fly in these in these situations because it maximizes the fish's uh, you know interests. It is a very uh, nutrient-rich looking food source. It is down right where they are. They're not going to have to um, put themselves at danger by rising in the water column or moving far away from their holding spot. Um, and also it, uh, it is, is presented in, in a way that is very attractive to them and, and having the attractive aspects of the fly, that motion, um, is going to really, uh, propel that fish to, to check it out bare minimum and maybe even take it very hard. So that's kind of my initial approach. I will make 
as many casts as I feel is necessary. Sometimes that's two or three. And if I'm not seeing anything, I'm not going to try three different colors. I'm not going to try a dry fly, a nymph, switch back to a dry fly. I'm going to try maybe uh, two or three casts of each fly. And if I'm feeling really like I need to probe it with a, a um, streamer, then I'll put on a heavy streamer and I'll get down in there. But usually it's two or three casts of the dry fly. And then if it's a deep enough pool, I will put a small streamer on and try that. And then I'll move on to the next one. Um, I really try to make sure that I have my polarized glasses on and I'm watching where my fly lands. And I'm trying to have a peripheral vision thing going on as well. That way, if I do make a bad cast, because these fish aren't stupid, um, just because they're not as wary as Spring Creek fish doesn't mean that they're they're stupid. Um, and they will see my uh, my cast. They will see my line. They will see a bad cast. They will see a bad mend. And so I try to keep my eye on, on if there's some flash somewhere else in that pool or somewhere else around me so that I can make a mental note of saying, all right, you know what, I'm going to stop. I'm not going to make a bunch more casts, try to coax that fish out. Uh, this fish is a survivor. It's learned to live in this kind of difficult situation. I'm going to back up out of the water. I'm not going to splash a bunch, and I'm going to move off, move on the trail, get up and over into the next pool, and make a mental note to come back and try to make a cast to that fish again. And that's a fun way to kind of, you know, come back as you've after you fish upstream, come back and hit those places where where you maybe spooked capital, not a capital S spook, but a lowercase s spook, a fish, and you can maybe get back onto that fish. So I fish upstream. And one of the things that I like to do as I fish upstream is to not just hit the pools, but hit other spots that look like a fish might live. Um, fish will live in the most amazing places. And a lot of times the spots that look the most attractive to us do hold fish, but there's other spots that you will begin to ascertain hold fish and hold decent fish the more and more that you spend time on these waters. It could be because the current goes underneath a rock and it creates a perfect little challenge, uh, channel or uh, trough for a larger fish to sit in where it's not fighting as much current, but it still gets a lot of food source come to it. It could be that there's a lot of overhanging cover, and so the larger fish likes to sit in there because it knows it's going to be safe from the overhead predators. Um, it never gets harassed by other anglers. It's just, you know, chills out there. Uh, just pay attention and fish in weird spots. Even if it's one cast, one cast does not cost that much. Sitting there and, you know, making 20 casts to the same spot in the pool, your time would be better spent and your energy would be better spent making five casts in that pool and then making five or six casts in other spots around that pool, trying to figure out if there's a fish that's holding in an off the beaten path spot. So that's kind of my approach. Now I could talk about this again for another 20 minutes and maybe we'll have a part two. What happens uh, as you're not catching fish? What happens into, if you move into skinnier water? What happens if the stream branches off? What happens if there is a tributary? There's a lot of different ways we can go with this. Uh, what happens if you fish downstream and that, that uh, mountain creek starts to get wider and warmer or if it meets up with another creek? How do you deal with that? Um, those, these are all great things to talk about. And like I said, maybe the, that would warrant a part two, but hopefully this has been helpful. Uh, if you want more information on fishing mountain creeks, you can always email me. Matthew at castingacross.com. You can look through the back catalog of the podcast. There's lots of very, you know, um, granular stuff. There's, I know there's at least one episode on fishing streamers on mountain creeks, um, on my favorite flies from mountain creeks, uh, all that stuff's back there. And then the, the website, my goodness, that's probably one of, if not the most, uh, prevalent topics that you will find over at castingacross.com. So I would just encourage you to check that out. This week on the podcast, Monday, uh, if you're listening to this in real time, Monday was Memorial Day. And so I had an article called The Soldier Angler. Now, this is not meant to minimize or trivialize the sacrifices of all those who have served, but it's just to kind of humanize uh, some of those who did who were also anglers. And so um, I wrote a little bit, but I also put a link to a book that came out in 1864 uh, called The American Angler's Book by a gent named Thaddeus Norris. And uh, this was written in the Civil War. And this is a huge book. And you can read all of it for free on Google Books because uh, it's, I believe, in the public domain. I think that's how and why they do that. So I would encourage you to check that out. Even just flip through to see kind of how people were fishing, why people were fishing, and how a Civil War soldier may have been thinking about fishing uh, at that time. Uh, of course, they had greater things to think about and worry about, but you know, so do you, <laughs> and, and you you manage to to uh, get out and uh, wet a line. So check out The Soldier Angler. Wednesday's post was called Fly Fishing Summer Reading Challenge. Fly Fishing Summer Reading Challenge. And uh, here I encourage you and everyone who read the article to uh, pick three books, one for June, one for July, one for August, about fly fishing. If you are a mystery novel reader, great. 
work in some fly fishing books. If you like reading history, great, read in, uh, you know, put in some fly fishing books. If you have some reading that you have to do for where you are in your education or where you are in your career, mix in some fly fishing books. Um, the the little equation that I ran was, you know, if you pick th uh, three 300 page books, that's 900 pages, but that's only 10 pages a day over the course of three months. And uh, it gets your brain working in cool and different ways. So I would encourage you to do that and to let me know what books you choose. Um, you can let me know at matthewcastingacross.com. I always take book recommendations. I always take books too. Um, I've, I've been uh, very thankful for the folks who've sent me books, either books they've written or books that they think that I would enjoy. So uh, definitely check those out. This week's recommendation would be a worthy book to add to your summer fly fishing reading challenge list. It's called About Trout, the Best of Robert Banke from Trout Magazine by Robert Banke. Uh, Bob Banke was a gentleman I had the privilege of getting to know over the years as I was one of the directors of the Rivers Conservation and Fly Fishing Youth Grant in Pennsylvania. And he came and was kind of our keynote speaker for uh, a number of years uh, until he, he passed away. But uh, Dr. Banke uh, knows more about trout, knew more about trout than anyone else who was, was around. Um, and more often than not, if, if you're reading anything about cutthroat trout out west, particularly the uh, isolation of populations and the identification of strains, uh, his name is going to come up in that literature. But this is a great little uh, uh, piece of, of, of uh, literature that contains a number of his articles from Trout Magazine. So Trout Magazine, four issues a month, if you're a member of Trout Unlimited. Uh, I think his articles were like the back page um, articles. And he would write things that had to do with trout biology and trout genealogy, but there was more to it than that because he wasn't just a scientist. He was also an angler and a lover and appreci appreciating member of our culture when it comes to the aesthetics of trout and the, where they live and uh, just, just beholding their beauty and uh, what they mean to us. So check out About Trout, the best of Robert J. Banke from Trout Magazine. I'll put a link to where you can pick this up on the internet. Ooh, it's, I just checked it out right now. It is looks like it's out of print, so you're going to have to pay a few bucks for it. But if you can get it used, uh, it looks like you can get it for under $25, which uh, it, it's worth more than that. But uh, if you're on a budget, uh, Check that out. And you know what? Go to use bookstores. That's where you can find stuff. But I'll I'll put it uh, uh, the, the link from Amazon on this podcast show notes over at castingacross.com. Thanks for listening to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. Please subscribe in your favorite podcast app and rate the podcast on iTunes. Then head over to castingacross.com for three posts a week on the people, places, and things that go into the pursuit of fish. that has the stories to back it a life to be proud of it's a winchester life yeah baby six eight western oh, i'll be over there baby right there tune in every tuesday at 7 p.m eastern on waypoint tv